Hello. All right. Thank you for coming. Welcome to our talk about Apache Mesa security. Um, we'll go into the security of Apache Ma the security features introduced in Apache Mesos itself, as well as some recommendations for the surrounding ecosystem. I am Adam Bordelon, a distributed systems architect at Mesosphere, Apache Mesos committer, and a DCOS committer. I've been specializing in security and storage in the area for almost four years now. Uh, and we've also got Alexander here, an another Apache Mesos committer uh, from Mesosphere. And yeah, we'll get right into it. So today, I'll start off with uh, some of the Mesos security basics. Uh, we've given, I guess this is my third or fourth talk on the, on the topic at various Mesos cons. So some of you may have seen the previous talks. We gave one at Mesos con North America last year that this is kind of an extension of. Uh, Alexander will go into some of the new and exciting security features since um, last year's Mesos 1.0. Uh, and then I'll wrap it up with some uh, discussion of multi-tenancy developments that are upcoming in, in Mesos. So, brief motivation. You guys probably care about security, which is why you're here, but who else cares about security? Anybody with any sensitive data, anybody that uh, has untrusted users. You know, if, as an operator, you can't always trust that your users are going to do what you want them to do with your system. And you can't always trust that your users are not going to mess with your other users. So if you've got you know, personally identifiable information, you've got legal requirements, you've got operations that should only be for administrators, um, you may even have multiple clients that shouldn't even know that each other exist on the same cluster. But from an operator's perspective, you want to co-locate them to, uh, to get the uh, improvements of uh, running all those workloads on the same physical hardware. So getting into some of the security basics, uh, we summarized last year's talk with uh, some of these, uh, with the basic idea that you need to firewall off the perimeter, you need to encrypt everything you can, add authentication to all, your, all the Mesos APIs as well as any others, um, you need to authorize any action that can perform any uh, modification to the system or uh, retrieve sensitive information. You need uh, to secure your own applications running on top of Mesos, which we described as very much do-it-yourself last year, but we've got a little more help for you this year. Uh, and then, of course, you want to isolate all the containers so that even if those workloads are co-located next to each other, they don't impact each other's performance in addition to not being able to actually see each other. Uh, and I'll also mention some of the custom modules and hooks you can use to extend Apache Mesos to provide your own uh, custom uh, implementations of these security uh, interfaces. So if you're going to firewall off the perimeter, uh, you have to poke some holes through for some of the services that you care about. You know, Mesos master to be able to view the whole state in the UI, Mesos agents to get at sandbox logs, uh, Zookeeper to you know, figure out which, leader, which Mesos master is the leader. Uh, and then you may need other system services that your operator needs access to when you don't not wanna necessarily want them SSHing into the cluster every time. And those could run on a variety of ports. Uh, your users may also need to access the uh, framework schedulers, UIs, and APIs themselves, as well as any APIs and UIs exposed by the executors and the tasks running on the agents. And those could run on a variety of different ports. And so you find that you may end up poking holes, poking dozens or hundreds of holes in your firewall, and then that's not actually as secure as you would hope. Uh, you know, especially if these services underneath are not properly authenticated and encrypted themselves. Uh, we've run into open source clusters that have Marathon exposed publicly on port 8080, and there are Metasploit scripts that will you know, jump in and you know, start Bitcoin mining uh, tasks on those nodes instantly. So you need to make sure you've firewalled off any access and you're actually authenticating uh, access to it or else scanners are just going to find it and 
start mining on you. So one thing that we've done in uh, the Mesosphere DCOS product is uh, build an API gateway, which is, we call it admin router for historical reasons, but it, uh, it's basically just an Nginx proxy with some configuration on top. Uh, and what this allows you to do is only expose a minimal number of ports outside of the firewall. Uh, so you have 22 so that you can still SSH in if you really need to. And then port 80 and 443 are the main ports through which you get into admin router. Uh, and then it has routes that, uh, that can provide access to Zookeeper, Mesos, Masters, other system services, as well as uh, frameworks running on top of Mesos. And because you've got this API gateway here that's you know, not somewhat smarter than a vanilla firewall, you can actually do SSL termination at the, at the gateway. You can do uh, authentication, requiring that nobody can get through to any of these routes unless they've authenticated with your system, uh, as well as some coarse-grained authorization so that you can say that only you know, operators or people with operator privileges can actually access Zookeeper or can access uh, your certificate authority or your secret store or something like that. Uh, we've also found it valuable to, uh, you know, create this notion of what we call public agents in DCOS. Uh, so a certain number of agents that have their own exposed IPs, uh, and then you can run load balancers like Marathon LB or the new Edge LB on top of that, which will then, uh, so you, those are exposed to the, the public internet and the requests to those are then load balanced across different uh, service instances. So if you've got a web server running on 100 different agents uh, privately inside the cluster, but then you want to serve that up to the outside world, uh, you can use the Marathon LB or Edge LB to load balance between those, but you still, of course, need to, you can do SSL termination at the LB, but you're still going to need authentication or else anybody can access that website, which is maybe what you want if you're hosting a public website. Uh, so you don't necessarily w want to require that all users must authenticate in the DCOS or Mesos way just to get access to your web servers or other applications. Uh, we, I mentioned you want to encrypt everything in Mesos. Uh, you have to enable lib event and SSL at configure time, at build time in order to actually get uh, SSL and TLS built into uh, Mesos. Uh, the packages distributed by uh, Mesosphere have that built in since 1.0, uh, but if you're building it yourself, you know, take note of these flags. Uh, you're gonna need to set environment variables to enable SSL. Uh, by default, we do not support downgrade, but if you're doing if you're upgrading from a, an unencrypted cluster to an encrypted cluster, uh, you'll probably stage it where you allow SSL but don't require it, and that's what support downgrade does. And then once you've got all the masters and the agents and schedulers and executors switched over to allow SSL, you can start requiring it across the board. Uh, you'll also need to specify a key file and certificate file. Uh, this is how you actually do the encryption. Uh, you can verify peer certificates when they're present and require that they're always present. And wait, what was underneath that? Oh, depth. Uh, and then you need the CA certificate uh, in a directory or a file in order to actually validate that these are properly signed certs. You can specify whatever ciphers you care about if you happen to be some sort of government entity or other organization that happens to know that some of these uh, ciphers are not secure anymore. I don't know that personally. Maybe you do. Uh, we disable SSL v3 and TLS v1.0 and 1.1 by default, so it's 1.2, which is the more recent one. If you need to support any of these for backwards compatibility reasons, you can enable that as described here. And uh, we've recently added support for ECDH curves, which Alexander will go into in a little while. Uh, authenticating agents and V0 schedulers. Uh, so those of you who don't know, Mesos started out with what we call the V0 API, and we've uh, 
with the 1.0 release, we added uh, a stable V1 HTTP API, or more HTTP-like than the previous one. Uh, going with the V0 API, you need to configure with SASL uh, built in, and you configure the masters with an authenticator. Default is CRAM MD5, but as I mentioned, they are modules, so you can extend this to have your own custom authenticator and authenticate E modules. Uh, with the CRAM MD5 authenticator, it's just a raw JSON file of credentials, and you have flags to require framework and agent authentication. On the agent, you have to have the authenticate and its own credential, and the V0 schedulers have to specify a credential when uh, initializing the scheduler driver, as well as setting that same principle on the framework info, uh, which is used for authorization. If you don't match those, you'll get an error when trying to register. A credential in this case is uh, just a string that is the principle or the, the ID that you're authenticating as, and an optional secret. Some authentication mechanisms do the secret management out of band, so you just need the, the principle and Kerberos, for example, might you know, use your key tabs and tokens that are on disk instead of passing those around in these, uh, these messages. HTTP authentication, uh, you know, as of 1.0, we, uh, we had a lot of these endpoints already authenticated. Uh, we recently added authentication to the V1 executor API, uh, which Alexander will go into in a bit. Uh, but all the rest of these endpoints are authenticated. Uh, so you are required to, by default, we do HTTP basic auth. But again, you can extend that with modules. Um, there are a couple of endpoints that are not authenticated, things like redirect or health, which don't expose any sensitive information and don't allow you to actually perform modifications to the state of the system. So we felt that was OK and sometimes necessary to know that a node is up before you, you know, actually bother to authenticate to it. Uh, authorizing these endpoints uh, comes through a variety of actions, because it's not just these endpoints. You know, in, V1, uh, in the V1 API, it's a single V1 operator endpoint, and then a lot of different actions you can perform uh, in the message that you send to that endpoint. Uh, we have deprecated a lot of these with role, with principle uh, action names uh, in favor of a more generic create volume or destroy volume, get quota, where there's an authorization object that has various metadata that you might authorize on. Uh, just because the initial authorization uh, module authenticated, uh, authorized creating volumes based on the role that, uh, uh, the, of the volume or destroying a volume based on the principle that created it doesn't mean that everybody wants to authorize based on that metadata. So we try to provide as much metadata as possible, like task infos, full resource fields. Uh, and that way, you can choose to authorize based on role, principle, uh, user that the task is running on, or you know, maybe arbitrary labels that you've tagged onto your tasks and volumes. Uh, we added a lot more uh, authorization actions since uh, last year. Uh, in addition to taking the V0 API's actions and extending those throughout the rest of the V1 operator API, uh, we also added new features for things like uh, attaching container input and output for debugging. Um, we had maintenance uh, primitives before, but they weren't authorized yet. Now they are. Uh, we also have nested containers for pod-like support, uh, some agent gone semantics. Uh, we now also authorize registering agents. So instead of just authenticating the agent, we actually can allow you to specify which principles are allowed to register as agents so you don't end up with somebody who just happens to have a scheduler credential being able to use that to spin up a new Mesos agent and claim tasks and resources. Uh, yeah, so you can get the whole list of, uh, of authorization actions in the authorizer.proto. Uh, they're all listed there. And if you find anything that you think needs authorization, file a JIRA, we'll you know, look into it and make sure that we can clean that up and 
prevent any unauthorized actions. So last year we talked about how application security was pretty much do it yourself. Uh, now that we've got secrets first class in Mesos, which Alexander will talk about in a minute, uh, you can actually distribute a lot of these uh, credentials and certificates and keys in secrets so that when your task runs, it already has its credential that it can use to authenticate with the Mesos master for framework authentication. Already has certificates it can use to uh, communicate over an encrypted channel with Mesos master or uh, other uh, components in the system. And you know if you're storing state in Zookeeper and you want to protect that state from unauthorized access from other tasks and um, bad actors, uh, you can use Znode uh, AuthZ, which bas is basically just a symmetric key. And so you want to be able to pass that symmetric key around so that even if your task dies and spins up somewhere else, it still has access to its Znode. For example, for leader election for your framework scheduler or any other state you're trying to store. Uh, similarly, you can use secrets for some of the other uh, encryption uh, features that you need to enable. Uh, you know, you're going to have to do network segmentation yourself. We're not building all of that in auto magically for you by default. On disk encryption, do it yourself. Uh, you know, Mesos does allow you to specify which Linux user you're running your tasks as, and you can use that to, as well as uh, providing file system images in your containers to prevent uh, other tasks from hopping around and accessing your sandbox. But you need to make sure you have a unique Linux user per application, because if everything is running as the nobody user and everything is readable by the nobody user, then every task can read every other task's sandbox. So beware of that. Uh, and then if your tasks themselves expose uh, UIs and APIs, you're going to have to you know, encrypt and authenticate and authorize any access there yourself. Uh, you know, if you have ideas for how Mesos can make this easier for you, uh, we welcome them. But uh, for now, We've focused on securing the Mesos platform itself and you know, providing any primitives we can come up with that make this easier for you. Container isolation is incredibly important for uh, you know, keeping tasks inside their containers and keeping them from accessing other containers, uh, as well as restricting the resources that they're using. So we had several isolators before. Uh, we've added quite a few more in the past year. Uh, we've got an isolator for AppC, we've got block IO, CPU sets, Linux capabilities and R limits, and uh, the new volume secret isolator uh, for file-based secrets. And you know, I mentioned uh, extending Mesos with custom modules and hooks. Uh, I've got here the list of all of the module interfaces and hooks that Mesos currently provides. Uh, I've marked in bold the ones that you might want to use if you're building your own custom security interface for, uh, for your Mesos platform, much like we've done with Mesosphere's Enterprise DCOS. So you can have a custom authenticate authenticator module pair for the v0 API, custom authorizer, uh, so that you, know, you don't have to specify, hand specify ACLs on every node. Uh, if you've got a custom authorizer and authenticator, you can have a central identity and access management store that uh, all of the nodes retrieve uh, ACLs from and use to validate uh, credentials. Um, got a lot of these different hooks. Uh, a lot of them are more relevant for the Docker containerizer because with the Mesos containerizer, uh, we have this isolator module, which is kind of a misnomer because it does it's actually just watching the entire container lifecycle. So you get access to perform modifications before you launch the container, right after the container is launched. Uh, when the container exits, you can monitor it periodically. Uh, and so we found that the isolator module is by far the most used, most extensible, most flexible module for not just security, but for pretty much anything that you want to do uh, injecting before, after, during uh, 
container lifecycle. Uh, then we've got the HTTP authenticators, uh, which can help you override the basic auth scheme. And uh, in coming up in Mesos 1.5, we've actually built in an HTTP authenticatee as well. So your V1 schedulers, as well as anything else that uh, you're building that might want to access the Mesos uh, HTTP API, can include that as a part of libmesos and uh, use it to automate the authentication with the master or agent APIs. And then we've got the secret generator and secret resolver uh, modules, which are new with the first class secret support that we've added in Mesos recently. So that was kind of a breeze through all the things that we've done in Mesos security in the past with some notes on some recent additions. And I'll hand it off to Alexander to talk about some of the more advanced features that we've added recently. Hey guys, so um, I will be focusing on the things, the most, most important things we have done over the last year. Um, so one of the most important things is the executor authentication. Uh, one of the issues we were tackling here is a very important security issue that happens when an executor is launched in, inside Mesos. Um, to understand, I will explain you how it used to be done, and then I will tell you what we did to, to fix this problem. So originally, an agent launches an executor, usually in a container, uh, and it injects the framework ID and the executor ID of this new legion created a executor in, as an environment variable. Then the executor launches, the container is initialized, and then uses uh, an API to register to the agent. This API, uh, this message will include, again, the framework ID that was given to him, the executor ID, and a PID, which is just like an identifier for this executor. Usually it's a combination of a IP and a port where the executor usually is listening, like the um, Mesos, Mesos uh, API, secret API is working. Well, not that secret, but it's like a private way of communicating. The problem here is that the framework ID is given, like if you have a long running framework, you can very easily get that ex uh, framework ID. And at the same time, the executor ID is given by the framework, so some executors for, uh, some frameworks, for example, just have an ever increasing integer number for the executor IDs. So you can really uh, guess what the next executor ID is going to be. And if you did that, anyone can claim to be that executor provided they register before the executor launch by the agent. So. We have a fake executor who just guess the f he knows the framework ID, just got just guess the executor ID, and just provide a PID, whatever the, it is, because the agent really doesn't verify that. Once the f the fake executor is there, the old executor will intend re intend to register. He won't be let because the this agent will say, "Hey, I already know that executor," and this and then this fake executor can just get all the information that was intended for the original executor, task definitions, secrets, etc. So what we did was uh, assign a unique signed token when we la launched the executor. Um, that's created with a secret that you pass to the agent that he will use to sign every token. Uh, so when he launched the executor, he will again give the framework ID, the executor ID, and this unsigned token as environment variables in the executor. So now it's much harder for anyone to claim to be the, the executor that was launched. At the same time, when he registers, he will pass the same values plus the PID, and then the agent can say, hey, I did sign this token with this information. So we not only verify that the token we gave him is the correct one, but the token has some information inside that is signed, so the agent can also verify that information. So how we did that? We use uh, JWT-based tokens because we can put anything we want in the payload. So what we add is 
the framework ID, the executor ID, and the container ID. So these three elements, as of the moment, are uh, put in the J JWT base token. We also signed it with an HMAC 256 uh, hash algorithm. And we use uh, HTTP authentication using Bearer Scheme, which means this uh, new feature is only available on new executors who use the HTTP v1 API. So if you're still using v0, I will highly recommend you to move to a new API. You can enable it by saying, when you launch the agent, giving it uh, the authenticate HTTP executor. And you will need the, secret, the executor secret key, which is a blob of data used to compute the token signature. Uh, it can be a path to a file with this blob of data or a base64 encoded 256-bit uh, number. So that's for executor authentication. One thing is um, it's designed to be used as a module, so you can overwrite the, the mechanism we use but some parts of the code uh, still expect to be able to read a JSON part that has the framework ID, executor ID, and container ID, so I guess we still have to, to fine tune this, this authentication so it's overridable completely by, by you guys, small writers. The other thing we really, really worked on over this last year was having secrets as first class citizens. So, the first thing that may pop in our head is what is the secret? And if you didn't attend the talk of like an hour ago or two hours ago, then I will try to summarize and I won't give you the fancy demo that was given before. So a secret is anything, any sensitive information. So you can have your passwords, your secure shell keys, certificates, API keys, so, and and the important thing about the secrets is that they only they should only be accessed by authorized users. So you, for example, don't want in your task definition to have your your passwords in clean text because then anybody can read them and, and probably connect to your database and play with it. So for Mesos, the the center structure that mas that manage the secrets is this message secret because it's a protobuf. And from then we can deduct a secret can be one of two things. It can be a reference or it can be a value. Reference secrets are just a way to describe how to get the secret. So they have a name and they, have, they must have a name. And optionally, because some secret stores, each secret is just like a, a hash map of key value elements. So optionally, you can just get the key in that is stored under that secret. It can also be a value, which is just the, con the, un the unencrypted contents of the equivalent reference secret. That's what a secret is. Now, how we fetch the secrets is based on this um, interface called the secret resolver. It just has one method, the resolve, and as you can guess, the parameter is just a secret reference. It, as I mentioned, the name is the only one required. The key is just optional. And it will return a secret value. Um, the, by default, like usually we provide you a default that is more or less usable in each of the interfaces from Mesos. I will never recommend to use the default of the secret resolver. Because he just assumes that each secret that comes in has the value already set in, unencrypted, so he will just give you back. So please, if you're going to play with it, create your own module, connect to your safe secret store. Uh, right now, there are many, and we didn't want to force uh, a dependency in Mesos. That's why we didn't provide a safe way of dealing with secrets. Also because we are not secret store experts, so it's, just, it's up to you guys. So how does this work? I imagine you have these two secrets. Uh, one is a certificate, so it's under the name Certificates Web API. The key is Web Server, web server Cert. Uh, and this won't help you because the certificate is I just created, so don't expect to break 
into mesosphere plus it's 128 bits key is very useless. And then you have the other secret, which is a database credentials UI, which just has like a key, a, a name and a password so you can connect to your database. So we have our fancy web API that we want to be able to launch in a container with some secrets. So sometimes you want your secrets to be available as environment variables, particularly like in the case of the password and the database username. You probably want that to be in, a, in an environment variable. So the way to do it is when you're doing the test definition in the environment section. Oh, I had an error here. The environment section, the environment needs like a variable described similar to this. And I use uh, YML so I could remove all brackets. So we focus on what is important. We have a name, a type which is a type secret, and the message secret will say it's a reference with the given name and the given key. So what happens when you launch a task which has this va variable? So you receive the task info. The agent takes and passes it to the environment secret isolator, which is enabled by default, so you will never have to set it up in the isolators. This will call your interface, your implementation of your interface, secret resolver, which will connect to a secret store, resolve your secret, and then your isolator will be on charge to put the value of the secret in your environment. And then your task will be able to connect to your database without problems. The thing is you don't always want your secrets to be environment variables. Sometimes you want them to be files that you can read, like the certificate. So in that case, the procedure is very similar. Now you, instead of creating an environment variable, you cr will create a mo uh, volume. And this volume, you will define it also like you give your the container path, and the source will be a secret now. And this secret will, like in our, in our case, will be the path to the certificate I just showed you before. So for this one, sorry, it's important that you enable the volume secret isolator. That one is not enabled by default. So when you launch your agent, you just say enable this isolator. And how it works, pretty similar as before. The volume secret isolator, we use the secret resolver, contact your secret store, receive the secret. And then he will mount uh, that in the path that you give this, uh, a temporary file system volume with the certificate that you wrote that you wanted as a file there. Important thing, the file is loaded in a temporary file system. You can modify it if you want, but these changes won't be transmitted to the secret store. So the secret store is a read-only operation. Uh, but you can do whatever you want with this file. It's just a file in your file system. We have a third kind of, se of secret we support. And with this, we wanted to solve the problem of how do we love, how do we download images from private Docker re registries in a secure way. The ways we could use, like you could pass uh, Docker config to the agent when you launch it. You could also put your credentials for your registry in, in your task definition, but you really don't want to do any of those because they are readable. So we decided, OK, let's put just the Docker configuration in our secret store and let our secret API fetch it for us. So this, of course, causes some constraints in how the secret has to be um, formatted or which type it has to be. So it needs to be a Docker config file. I think that's pretty obvious. But it needs to be formatted as a JSON. It needs to be in UTF-8. That's what we expect it to be. And of course, it needs to contain the, the credentials to a registry. That, I think that's pretty obvious. So this basically works. Uh, again, when you're launching your executor, uh, you will pass like the message image, then the Docker. And in the Docker, the important one is this secret, optional secret config. If you give this optional secret config, he will use the path in the, sec the reference in the secret to retrieve your, your image, like to contact your secret store. How does it work? Pretty similar as everything before, except now you won't go through an isolator, but the provisioner. So he will get the config file, the keys, and then it will contact your Docker registry 
based on the configuration that he just downloaded from the secret. Once he contacts the Docker registry, he will get the, con the <laughs> container image and then launch your container, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, constraints we have, the secret, uh, the secret API is only available for the Mesos containerizer. Sorry about that, <laughs> if, you, if you're a Mesos uh, Docker follower. Um, you and the image pool secrets is only available for Docker images that are running with the Mesos containerizer. So that's pretty much for the Mesos group. And I will talk about the elliptic, ellipt elliptic curve the cryptography support. Um, the problem with this was that was an oversight because you have to implement an extra API when you instantiate all your SSL. Um, so we corrected this oversight. Now we enable the ACDHE, which is elliptical curve Diffie Hellman, which is just the part how you do key exchanges in TLS. The important thing of this is that you can have equivalent prote protection with smaller keys. So you know the, the strongest security is given by symmetric encryption. So you have the best security with the smaller keys, but then the problem there is you have to share your key. Then you have the public private key support, which is the initial part of an SS, uh, TLS connection. So traditionally we use RSA with Diffie Hellman. And uh, not long ago, like 10 years ago, we started working with elliptic curve. So the cool thing is if you see a one kilobyte um, RSA DH key is as secure as 160 bits elliptic curve key. And if you go bigger, you say like a 15 kilobytes RSA Diffie Hellman key is as secure as a 521 bits elliptic curve key. This not only reduces the, the size of the messages you're passing when you are negotiating a connection, it also reduces the amount of cryptographic operations your CPU will be doing. So, so in that sense, elliptic curve is really, really in, an interesting topic. Um, they also use it to solve the Fermat-Las theorem, so elliptic curves are very interesting if you're into math. Uh, so I will recommend you guys to think about using it. In order to use it, you need to use the, lip, the lip process SSL key file, and for this, you need a special key, like the traditional RSA keys that we used with the um, SSH key gen do not work. You need, actually you use SSH, SSH key gen, but you use different set of parameters and then you get an easy key. And then you pass, you need to change the process SSL ciphers because the default ones are, don't have ACDHE enabled. So you, we support all these ciphers that you see right behind me. The important thing, very important, is the key and the cipher must match. If you want easy keys, you need to put at least one of these uh, ciphers. Otherwise, you will get a bunch of errors that the connection could be initi initiated because the handshake couldn't be done. So very important. And I think that's pretty much what we have for you in new features. Uh, we definitely are working hard so on, on making Mesos as secure as possible. So I will ask you guys, test. If you find a bug, notify us. We, we really take this seriously. And, and we're trying to make Mesos more secure every day. So there you go. All right. And on the topic of making it more and more secure, I'll talk briefly about uh, some multi-tenancy concerns. So. You know, if you're a single user using a Mesos cluster, you have no problem seeing everything. But if you're a, you know, hundred thousand person organization uh, spread out across different departments and teams and projects, you may have legal requirements that, you know, your home mortgage department can't access your stock investment department. You may have, uh, you know all sorts of different requirements that, you know, sales shouldn't see what engineering's working on and, you know, the upcoming releases. Uh, and so you, you often end up 
with kind of a hierarchical organization, uh, you know, maybe split between different environments, different departments, different teams, different projects. And uh, similarly, you're going to want to partition your resources and your tasks uh, in a corresponding manner. So uh, in the past year, we've introduced hierarchical roles to Mesos. Uh, you may remember roles as a mechanism for partitioning resources in a rather flat manner where each framework can re register as a single role and you can reserve resources or uh, set quota for a particular role. And you know that allowed you kind of this flat namespace where each framework had one role. You could theoretically have multiple frameworks share a role, but they have to you know, work very closely with each other to not step on each other's toes. Uh, but now you can have a hierarchical roles so that can match the same kind of hierarchy so that you could have a framework uh, you know, in the dev sales app project. You could have a framework in the uh, test sales app project or you know, any of these. And you can do quota at every, at every level of this hierarchy. So you can have a top level administrator say, OK, I want sales to have this many resources and engineering to have this many resources. And then within that, they don't have to care how it's distributed. Then you know, the head of engineering says, OK, well, I've got the front end team, the back end team, the interns, and R&D. And you, know, you can split things up there. And then within the front end team, maybe you've got different projects, and you want to split up the resources there as well. So you can set quota at every level here. And uh, we do have uh, validation that you know, lo quota lower in the hierarchy does not exceed the quota of its parent. So you're actually taking 100% and distributing it across all of the nodes in the hierarchy. Uh, we also have added reservation refinement. So uh, a top level administrator could say, you know, these resources on these particular nodes are reserved for the engineering department. And I don't care what they do with them, but they're theirs now. Sales is never going to get offered them. They're dedicated to engineering. And then a, uh, an operator or even a framework within engineering could take that and further refine it and say that, OK, well, I, now that I know that I've got maybe this uh, disk resource that's available for engineering, I'm going to take it and use it for this particular application. And once I've refined the reservation, down to my node in the hierarchy, if uh, you know, my task dies, I know it's, those resources are going to be offered back to me and not just to anybody in engineering. And so this gives you flexibility to partition your resources between the different frameworks and teams and projects, however you've organized your, your role hierarchy. Uh, and it's also important to note that a single framework can actually register for multiple roles and multiple roles anywhere in the hierarchy. So you could imagine uh, a framework that for, you know, maybe it organizes its own applications within different folders, and you could have those folders map to hierarchical roles. Uh, and in that way, you can manage the hierarchy within your application and all the, uh, the projects and tasks running within it and map that onto uh, the role partitioning of your resources. Uh, a second way you can use the, this namespacing is authorization namespacing to control which users can access which tasks. Uh, you know, if you have Alice that works in sales and Bob in engineering, uh, it's a pretty common setup that you would want to make sure that Alice can't you know, see Bob's tasks and frameworks, and Alice can't even um, modify them or you know, start uh, tasks on those resources. So uh, you can do authorization namespacing based on these roles as well. Uh, and we're going to, you know, we remove the with role and with principle on a lot of the authorization actions so that we can move closer and closer to uh, doing authorization namespacing. Uh, and you can similarly do secret namespacing based on the same kinds of hierarchical roles. You know, you have a task that's running in a particular uh, hierarchical role, and you have a secret that's namespaced a certain way, so you can say that only these tasks can access these secrets, or only these users can access these secrets. Uh, you can tie that into permission management, 
uh, when you're setting up ACLs, the uh, namespace is going to be a big part of what permission you're, you're managing. So not only this user or this framework can launch tasks, but this framework can launch tasks only within this particular namespace. You can do chargeback accounting to know, you know which resources were used by which projects, departments, teams, and even tie in naming and discoverability. You know, if you have two different teams that both want to run something called Spark, how do you make sure that they are uniquely namespaced? Namespaces. Uh, and so that's, that's it for uh, what we've got to talk about today. Uh, we are going to open it up to Q&A. Uh, there were a couple of security talks already today and a couple more relevant ones coming on later in this afternoon, as well as the town halls, which I encourage you all to visit. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll open it up for qu any questions you may have. I know that this is a complex topic, and I'm sure you have some, some deep questions. Yeah, I'm a, bi I'm a bit skeptical about the way uh, the secrets are handled because uh, in the secret resolver, there's no context information regarding a secret. So it's just a secret itself. And uh, in your previous slide, you talked about uh, namespacing secrets. My question is, uh, if I understand correctly, the uh, secret resolver is running as a normal uh, process, yeah, it has no context information. So how can the namespace be performed? It's not possible in my opinion. I don't know. Well, the, the thing is, um, okay. as it is right now, the secret resolver is just an interface, and it just takes a name. So pretty much all this, all this uh, namespacing and, and the stuff is left for the person who implement the interface, which we don't do. We, we, left, we just designed the interface, and it's up to, to Mesos users to implement the interface and they configure it as you guys see fit. My, my point is, it's not possible regarding this interface to namespace properly in the user's process. Because it's just a key. So, if I have a specific request for a specific My, my uh, issue is, uh, if I understand correctly, the uh, secret resolver is stateless. So he has no context information. So he cannot say, or he cannot, it means that any task run using the secret resolver can access the secret from anybody, right? My point is, uh, if we uh, want really to, uh, to split secrets, at least the secret resolver has to uh, have at least the, the user uh, uh, the task is running on and so on. Yeah, so I believe, I believe the secret resolver also has access to the task metadata. So you, you know the task ID and any labels associated with it. So you can tag that onto the task. And then you also have minimal metadata about the secret itself. Uh, the name could be a hierarchical path. So you can have namespacing on the secret itself as well as metadata about the task's namespace. And you can match that only tasks in namespace foo slash bar can access secrets in namespace foo slash bar. So you can tie them together that way. Uh, but there's certainly room for improvement. All right, thank you. We'll be outside at the booth if you have further questions uh, at the Mesosphere booth. <laughs>